the full screen. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm just trying to. <clears throat> so let me start with thanking Dr. Mayur, very close friend, very upcoming, very eminent endocrinologist from central part of India. He had asked me to give a talk on a time in range, which is can be considered as a replacement for HbA1c. So, in next 15 to 20 minutes, I will end without any disclaimer. I don't have any financial disclosure for this talk, except that uh, the term is time in range and the consensus which was made uh, in Paris for continuous glucose monitoring and then in Berlin again in ETTD meeting in two, uh, one, uh, 19, 2019. In both the expert group, I was part of it and uh, I was one of the author for that. One very important thing in diabetes, I think this goes very truly that if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And this is very, very important when we are talking to our patient, if they are not measuring it. Here, I am not just talking about the time in range, but overall sugar monitoring, overall monitoring for A1C, getting the doctors on regular follow-up and even monitoring for the complication. Also, if you don't do it, we can't improve the care for diabetic patients. And one of the reasons for our patients not to have a good control that as we have the different data to show that two thirds of our diabetic patients are not under good control. One of the important reason for them is they are not measuring. I mean, the continuous glucose monitoring or self-monitoring people in India are not monitoring regularly. Now, there are three pillars to manage dysglycemia. As we know that it's a chronic hyperglycemia, uh, uh, which is very important. It's a diabetes. Treatment is required. It was DCCT and UKPDS for type 1 and type 2 have clearly demonstrated a direct link between A1C and development of diabetes-related complications. So we understood that a hyperglycemia in a diabetic patient is to be treated and we should try to achieve a good glycemic control. And at that point of time, the good glycemic control, uh, the parameter was A1C that was decided and it is well-established parameter since last 25 years. But one of the limiting factor for a tight glycemic control was always a hypoglycemia. Just before Dr. Sandeep talked about glycemic variability, this is a third pillar of managing di diabetes or dysglycemia. It is just not the HbA1c good control. It is just not about the prevention of hypoglycemia, but at the same time, we don't want our patient to have a glycemic variability. And that's how this time in range concept had come out because even the patients who are having good control of diabetes, still they may have a higher glycemic variability will lead to more complication. Let me start with one example. You may have a patient who is multiple times monitoring, like routine type 1 diabetic patients. Many of our patients who are monitoring their sugar three times, four times in a day. You can say the fasting sugar, pre-lunch, post-pre-dinner, or post-dinner or bedtime. Most of the sugar reports are normal, or at least out of four, three of them are absolutely under good control. But if I do continuous glucose monitoring for the same patient, you will find that actually this patient is developing hypoglycemia pre-lunch. Post-lunch, there is a hyperglycemia and midnight, there is a hypoglycemia too. So it is the continuous glucose monitoring. It is a CGM that can detect it. It is not just a random blood glucose monitoring. Even somebody is doing three times, four times, or even seven times in a day, still there is a possibility you may miss. It is a random blood glucose monitoring is like a taking a still photograph while continuous glucose monitoring is like taking a videography. You can definitely see continuously that when somebody is developing hyper or hypoglycemia. So is HbA1c alone is enough for managing diabetes? And that's an important question which we are going to discuss that whether we can replace it or even HbA1c alone is enough for managing diabetes. You may have two different type of patient. Just now, Sandeep had talked about the glycemic variability. You may have two different type of patient with same A1c. One may have a lot of glycemic variability, a lot of glycemic fluctuation. The mean amplitude of glycemic excursions are very high. But other side, a patient, you may have less glycemic variability, no hypoglycemia, and still the A1C, both the patients may have same. So these two, when we are comparing, will definitely tell that A1C alone is not enough for managing diabetes. Let me give one more example. These are the four different type of patients with all of them have HbA1C of same, 8 A1C. But if you do that continuous glucose monitoring, 
Even managing them will be also different. The patient first, you will find the fasting hyperglycemia. The other patient with even the 8 a one c there is a fasting hypoglycemia. The other patient with the a one c is a post-breakfast, post-lunch and post-dinner. All three sugars are high still. The a one c is 8. And last patient where it is the fourth one, it is only the post-dinner sugar which is very high and still the patient a one c is same. So you may have these different type of patient with a one c same. But all these patients, if we just target A1C to get control and you try to treat these patients with the similar type of medication because you want to achieve A1C below 7. From 8 to 7, I think all these four different patients will require four different type of management strategy. They cannot be just increasing the dose of whatever the medication which they are taking or by adding the medication probably may not lead to a perfect control for these patients. You may have the first patient where you're long acting or something to take care of fasting hyperglycemia and the other patient, you have to reduce the dose of something which is actually causing fasting hyperglycemia. So A1C alone may not be sufficient in many of the situations when you want to precisely control the diabetes and when you want to achieve A1C control from 8 or 8.5 to 7 or 6.5 without getting hypoglycemia unless we do continuous glucose monitoring. So where the rational is? Do you think that all the patients need CGM? Yes, roughly we can say everyone if we can have it. But the reason why we want continuous glucose monitoring because A1C does not track glycemic excursion. 60% of the low, which is hypoglycemia, may not be revealed on random blood glucose monitoring. And it's a continuous glucose monitoring identify four times more glucose excursion than SNBG. So, I mean, you can get all the excursion only through CGM2. CGM is beneficial for those who are not meeting their A1C goal, have frequent low glucose, are unaware of their low blood sugar, want to reduce their A1C target, hypoglycemic events, and have widely variable blood sugar level. And our children or adolescents who are willing to use. So, at present, we have more data to support that for type 1, for patients who are on more on insulin, there are more risk of hypoglycemia, primarily to prevent hypoglycemia, then to achieve a good glycemic variability. They are the one to whom we need the continuous glucose monitoring. Unless we do CGM, we will not able to get the time in drain, that concept which we are going to talk. So the classification, do we have a different type of CGM? Luckily, in our country, we have all variety of CGM. We have real time. We have FGM, which is intermittently scanned CGM. We have professional CGM with, uh, again, a patient can be put on this and patient has to come back to the clinic or to the doctor to get the continuous glucose report. And we have even integrated CGM when it is along with uh, pump, uh, the CGM system is there and you can see the continuously glucose monitoring on your pump system only. Now, do we have data that is CGM? can reduce significantly the risk of hypoglycemia. Let me go back uh, for the DCCT. 1983, this trial was done. And to achieve HbA1c of less than 7, that was the primary target for all these type 1 adolescents and young adults. Type 1 diabetic patients, the mean A1c of these patients was 9. And they could reduce it to 7.2 by intensively monitoring them 4 times in a day and giving them insulin uh, also. But at the risk of with the severe hypoglycemia rate was 62 per 100 patients here in 1983. After 25 years, in 2008, almost similar type of patients, mean A1C of these patients were 7.6. They could achieve their A1C 7.1. It was only difference. The major difference was between these 1983 to 2008. Other than that, a newer insulins were used in that. It was... CGM used and these patients could achieve that uh, A1C from 7.6 to 7.1. But the risk of hypo, which was in disease, was 62 per 100 patient year. It decreased to 20 per 100 patients year. After eight years, the pivotal trial where this was integrated CGM, it means the pump was also used in these patients and the risk of hypoglycemia could reduce to zero. So you can understand how this technology, how this continuous glucose monitoring can help our patients to achieve not only a target A1C, but for better glycemic control without getting hypoglycemia. Now, do we have data for type 2? 
and this is the paper from Unni. Unni is also there. That can we have the using continuous glucose monitoring or the ambulatory glucose profile, which we are using more often in our country, which is a professional CGM, uh, EZP in patients with type 2 diabetes. And they are not on even insulin. Can we have that? And in that consensus, Unni, myself, Shashank, many more were the part of it. And it was published in uh, JAPI, where we had put the consensus that, yes, we can use uh, the EZP for type 2 diabetes patients for even oral anti-diabetic agents and how it is useful for them to achieve a good control uh, and less glycemic variability. Using retrospective, even optimizing and managing type 2 diabetes, one more paper from B. Mohan, we were again the part of that group. And this was the international consensus, which was in 2017, where I was part of it. And there we talked about the where we should use CGM. Definitely all across the world, it was in consensus that all type 1 diabetic patients, if they can have, they can should use continuous glucose monitoring. Those who are type 2 on insulin, or on hypoglycemic agent, they should be also. Hypoglycemic agent means like sulfonylurea, which can lead to, because primary purpose of using CGM was to have less glycemic variability and less and less hypoglycemia. That was the primary purpose. And it was after two years, they have come out with a target that if we are doing a continuous glucose monitoring, can we have a range, what range which should we should give to our patients or to the clinician and all over the world, all associations have endorsed that we should use time in range, a concept for those patients who are using continuous glucose monitoring. So I can say if somebody is using CGM and getting TIR regularly, then they can be replaced. They can replace. But in India, as all our patients are not doing CGM continuously, unless you do CGM continuously and every time you achieve time in range and then you can have, uh, you can replace A1C. Now this is the a routine garden variety of type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients, more than 70% of the time, their sugar should be between 70 to 180. That is what the target is. But it is not acceptable for more than 5% if they go in hypoglycemia, less than 70 it is not acceptable if more than 25% of the time their sugar goes more than 180, but it is not acceptable if more than 5% of the time their sugar goes more than 250, which is grade 2 hyperglycemia. So we had come out with a green box. We had come out with a yellow and red and dark red and dark yellow just to an, an, uh, teach that what is grade 1 and grade 2 hyperglycemia, similarly grade 1 and grade 2 hypoglycemia too. But those who are elderly, higher risk for hypoglycemia, hypo unaware awareness, there also even more than 50% it is required to achieve a time in range and those patients because they are at higher risk of hypoglycemia and awareness or elderly and frail patient, it is not acceptable for them to go even for 1% of the time, more than 1% of the time going below 70 and it is not acceptable for them to go below 54 by any condition. If this happens, you have to change the therapy. Then pregnancy and type 1 diabetes, the glycemic targets are slightly more controlled, which is between 63 to 140. While with pregnancy and gestational diabetes, the 63 to 140 is almost for 90% of the time. So in GDM or hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes patients, hyperglycemia in pregnancy or type 2 diabetes patients, more than 90% of the time, they should be in range between 63 to 140. This is one paper which I have written the time in range is a target in type 2 diabetes. So we have a lot of evidence for type 1. But do we have evidence for type 2 diabetes also? To consider them, can we give them a target that if they can also achieve 70% of the time, can we replace A1C for them? As most of our type 1 also in India who are not using because of affordability issue, in type 2 we are actually using intermittently intermittent and that's the reason we had also come out with a paper which I will show that how frequently one should do continuous glucose monitoring in type 2 diabetic patients too. We have a data to support that if somebody have a better time in drains, there is a less microvascular complication. Similarly, uh, Lesser the time in range, a patient will have more time, uh, complication too. In 2019, time in range concept was published in diabetes care. It was the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology first society in 2020. In their guideline, they have put that CGM should be considered 
as a comprehensive management for type 2 diabetes. As I'm telling you that we have a lot of data to support the type 1 diabetes across the world. Everybody accepted that in type 1 diabetes, if we can do CGM, if we can get time in range, uh, we can even replace for them even A1C and we should do continuously monitoring for these patients to achieve a good time in range. But for type 2 diabetes, it was the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology first time in 2020, immediately after one year of publication, they had come out that CGM should be considered whenever indicated to assist patient in reaching glycemic goals safely for type 2 diabetic patients. These are some of the papers which we have also written in JAPI and Diabetes Metabolic Syndrome and Clinical Research and Review. This is one recent paper that how frequently one should do a continuous glucose monitoring. So I will not put that A1C can be replaced particularly for South Asia. What we had written in this particular paper that all three are complementing each other. It's not the a CGM or continuous glucose monitoring, achieving time in range, getting a time in range value can replace A1C because our patients are not doing continuous glucose monitoring 24 by 7. Every 15 days, they are not changing. Rather, we are asking them once in three months, once in two months, once in a month, depending on their how sugar better control or not good control. We ask our patient to do random glucose monitoring, A1C and intermittently intermittent using continuous glucose monitoring. So all three they are actually complementing each other and they all are essential. Let me give an example for a type 2 diabetes and how precisely we are treating diabetic patients or in a precision diabetology. This is one of our patients with 9.2 A1C with triple drug combination uh, with a gliptin, with a metformin, with a sulfonylurea, with a full dose of sulfonylurea. Patient was asked to put on insulin because 9.2 with a triple drug, patient had already gone to two diabetologists, endocrinologists. Patient was not ready that I will go for the insulin. We explained the patient that it is your sugar which is really very high, but still your diet is also very uncontrolled. Let me put you on a uh, CGM, on an ambulatory glucose profile and let me see that how your sugar is. On fifth day when patient had come back, we had seen that his sugar are always high. Post meal sugar are very high. We asked the patient, let us change. We should give only injectable because insulin, if you don't want, because of your dietary habits, let me put you on GLP-1, SGLT-2, remove his uh, gliptin and we reduce the dose of glimipride also. And we ask the patient every alternate day, please check your fasting sugar and call us. So from the 2 milligram of glimipride with GLP-1 and with SGLT-2, patient alternate day was calling from 2 to 1 milligram on third day we have done. Again on 3rd February we have done to 0.5 and when patient had come back to on 4th Feb to us, we stopped his 0.5 milligram also. And now the patient is only on GLP-1, SGLT-2 and metformin. And you can see his last 4 days report was absolutely well controlled. So you may have with a guideline, based therapy, what would you like to give? Patient has to be given insulin because that is what 9.2 A1C sugar is uncontrolled. Patient is already on triple drug therapy, but precisely while doing continuous glucose monitoring, you can convince the patient also to start a newer therapy. You can also convince the patient and educate the patient for his good dietary control and that what the result is here. And for two years, patient had continuous almost all three things and he has reduced his weight by almost 15% with A1C keeping less than 6 and now we had stopped the patients even from that also. He is only on metformin for other two years and is still maintaining the HbA1c of less than 6. So it is almost like a reversal with 15% of the weight loss. A patient whom we were starting with the insulin with 9.2, you can see how this continuous glucose monitoring and how to, uh, you know, uh, a time in range concept has change the therapy. It is completely like a paradigm shift in managing type 2 diabetic patients. Also, you may have different type of patterns when we are doing continuous glucose monitoring, explaining the patient that even your A1C is very well controlled, but still in time in range concept, you will not you will say that your post meal glucose level, particularly post breakfast is very high and here you are getting somewhere hypoglycemia. So these are the things we can change by putting the patients on continuous glucose monitoring. Different examples we can give. We can explain the patient that how we can change your therapy by uh, showing them 
the graph of continuous glucose monitoring and explaining them in time and range. I usually use the word when we are explaining the patient, your glucose is in range. That on a continuous glucose monitoring, how much time your glucose is remaining in range, that is what we call them as a time in range. With that, continuous glucose monitoring actually assisting us discovering unknown hyper and hypoglycemia, which may be silent or asymptomatic or symptomatic. It also gives us the observation of glycemic variability. It assess the patient for how much time they are in out of range or in range or below the range. It is also giving us the idea about the severity of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia during day and night time. It provides actionable information which is derived by continuous glucose monitoring report. It highlights the impact of behavioral variances. It analyzes glycemic effects of new intervention effectively and efficiently. It gives us the... Uh, uh, even uh, digitally, we can monitor these patients if the continuous glucose monitoring is put somewhere and patient is sending the reports on uh, mobile. We can do the care of diabetes even digitally or uh, remotely also controlling the diabetes and continuous glucose monitoring enhances patient self-management, adherence and confidence in diabetes management. With this, I thank once again, thank you Mayur for giving me an opportunity. Thank you very much.